Good day, everyone. Welcome to the creation.com webinar. And this one is about why Genesis matters, what it really means, and why it's so important not to deny the plain meaning. Now, we're from Creation Ministries International, and I am a PhD scientist. I used to shine lasers onto selenium ring molecules, look at the scattered light, publish in secular scientific journals. So I'm a real uh, scientist, the, the person that evolutionists say doesn't don't exist, a scientist who believes the Bible. And in fact, science actually grew out of a Christian worldview. And in fact, most of the founders of modern science were Bible-believing creationists. Now, I guess by now you know I'm not from this country, right? So I better give you a geography lesson about where I come from. I come from this place, but I did move over here 10 years ago. And one reason is we have two little granddaughters who live in Florida, and it's much easier to drive 500 miles to visit rather than fly 9,000 miles. And I'm also a retired chess master. I sometimes play chess from memory called blindfold chess. You see what, what's happening here? Uh, this guy is making my moves for me and telling me what my opponents are doing. And I've got the uh, positions memorized somehow. And I've played with some good people in my time. Now, another thing about me, I'm also ethnically Jewish. My name is the Hebrew word for Frenchman, so I can tell Jewish jokes and French jokes and get away with it. Now, let's tell you a bit about our ministry. Well, one thing is we have a website, which is free. You're probably aware of this by now. Uh, but in case you're not, our website is very hard to remember. As you see, creation.com. And one way you can be connected to it is by our free email newsletter called the Infobytes. And we promise not to spam you or to give or sell your address to any third party. We protect your privacy. And here is one way you can do it from online. Uh, you can text your email and zip code uh, to this number here, 470344-INFO, or 4636. And we answer a number of different questions, but the two main categories is, is creation true and does it matter? And here's an example of one of the articles, uh, classic articles in the archives that you'll be informed about, should we trust the Bible? And also we keep up to date with creation news, like you may have seen our article on the coronavirus as, and where, why would God create a virus? That's one of the major articles recently. Now you might say though, for the talk I'm doing here, the textbook is the Genesis account. There's a 800 page commentary on Genesis 1 to 11. And it covers things like, what does the Hebrew text mean? How is it defendable scientifically? And what did the New Testament authors and Jesus himself say about it? Because I think one of the strongest evidences for taking Genesis as history is this is clearly the view of Jesus himself. And you can uh, have a look at uh, this book. Here's the shortcut for you, creation.com slash account uh, to have a look at that. And also we have a companion teaching series, video teaching series. Again, you can look through uh, look how to get this at creation.com slash academy. Now, during the talk, you're going to have a chance to ask questions in the chat, and I'll be uh, answering them with a, with a colleague, and also for 30 minutes after this talk. So it's only fair I should ask you a question, isn't it? Uh, what was Jesus' first miraculous act recorded in the Gospels? Now, a lot of people give this answer. But I have to respectfully disagree with this answer because this is John chapter 2, said to be the first sign to his disciples during his earthly ministry. But you go back to John chapter 1, what do we see? In the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God, the Word was God, he was with God in the beginning. Well, who was the Word here? This is Jesus himself. And it tells you, through him all things were made. Without him nothing was made that has been made. You see, even before he was born, Jesus is the creator of the universe. So we see John's gospel written to tell us about Jesus as Messiah, and we can have eternal life through believing in him. But he starts off saying that Jesus is God and creator. So you can see that Darwinism is an attack on the person and work of Jesus. Now, when you look at this gospel and you go into the Greek, you can see where John is getting his ideas from. He expected his readers to go to Genesis 1. In fact, it begins the same way. En arche, in the beginning, is, is the first two words of both John 1.1 and Genesis 1.1. So he's 
intending his readers to think of Genesis and the creation account when he begins his gospel. Now, of course, Jesus is not just God, he's also fully man, that's how he can be the mediator, and this is foretold by the prophet Isaiah, he said the Redeemer will come to Zion to those in Jacob who repent of their sins. Now the Hebrew here is Goel, which actually means the kinsman Redeemer. And if you go to the Old Testament, like the book of Ruth, you'll see the qualifications needed for a kinsman Redeemer is that he's related by blood to those whom he redeems. So if Jesus is our kinsman Redeemer, he must be somehow our blood relation. Well, how is this possible? Well, we see this in the genealogies or ancestry line that we see in two of the Gospels. Like we see Matthew's Gospel written to Jews. So he starts from the first Jew, Abraham, traces him to King David through the blue line here of the kings of Israel and Judah, ends up with Joseph. And notice the dotted line because Jesus was born of a virgin. So Matthew is tracing the legal line of Jesus, not the biological. Luke is the one who takes care of the biological line because he's tracing Mary's line. And he goes backwards from Jesus to Mary, to another son of David called Nathan, to King David, and then to Abraham. Uh, but Luke was writing to Gentiles, to non-Jews, so he didn't stop at Abraham. He goes to where Abraham came from. See, Abraham didn't just drop out of the sky in Genesis 12. He actually had ancestors. And where do you find them? You find them in Genesis 11 and 5. And you see that Luke quotes those names as real historical people. Abraham was son of Terah, son of Nahor, etc., to son of Noah. And then all the way back up to Adam, who is called the son of God, not the son of an ape. So you can't mix evolution and the Gospels. The Gospels are very clear. Adam was a real historical person, the first man directly created by God, the ancestor of everyone else on earth who ever lived, and the ancestor of Jesus. And therefore, no matter what race or people group or nation you come from, you can be saved through Jesus, your kinsman redeemer. But if you throw out a historical Adam, what happens to the kinsman redeemer idea? And it's also important because Jesus said a number of different things. He said, Scripture cannot be broken. Now, is Genesis part of Scripture? Well, he's saying, therefore, Genesis can't be broken. And how often he would uh, quote the Bible as God's word. He said, have you not read what was spoken to you by God? So what you read in Scripture is what God has spoken to us. And this includes... Uh, foundational doctrines. But the thing is, the Bible is a book of history. You can't really separate the morality and the theology of the Bible from the history of the Bible. I mean, think of the resurrection. If the resurrection didn't happen, we uh, have no faith at all. But the resurrection had to happen in history to be real, to be part of our faith. And same with marriage, clearly a, great, a moral teaching under severe attack in the world. But when Jesus was asked about that, where does he go? He goes to where it began. From the beginning of creation, God made them male and female. Therefore, a man shall leave his father and mother, hold fast to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. So here he's quoting from the first two chapters of Genesis, and he's quoting them as real history about the first man and woman. You see, there are some people who say that Jesus said nothing about gay marriage, but I beg to differ because here he's defining marriage as a male and female. This is the only marriage that Jesus recognizes. And he says, this is the marriage that God ordains in the beginning. And we see other important things. A man leaves his father and mother because the first man, Adam, had no father and mother to become one flesh because Eve was taken from Adam's flesh. And notice uh, the two become one flesh. It's not, not more than two. So it's one man and one woman, not one man and four women. Okay. So when you have the history of marriage, then all the morality makes sense. If you abandon this history, marriage hasn't got a leg to stand on. And now let's go into this passage a little bit more deeply 
And notice he said from the beginning of creation. Now, if you take the timeline straightforwardly, creation was a little bit over 4000 BC. I calculate about 4175 BC in my commentary and I explain how I did that. But then compare six days with that. Now, what's six days compared to a 4000 year timeline? See, it's right at the beginning, as Jesus said, from the beginning of creation, there were male and female. And six days from the beginning compared to 4,000 years is at the beginning. Now, let's compare this with the secular view. We are told there was once a big bang where nothing exploded and became everything. That's supposed to be science. And that was about 14 billion years ago. And Earth is about four and a half billion years old, and we swung down from the trees supposedly a few million years ago. So where is that on the timeline? You see, if you draw that time onto scale, humans appear almost at the end of it, not at the beginning. So how can we say from the beginning of creation, God made the male and female if there are billions of years before humans even existed? It doesn't make sense. So you've got to make a choice. Is Jesus right or is the Big Bang right? They both can't be right. You see, if Jesus is God, what he says must be true. And also we see that God the Father endorsed God the Son. This is my beloved Son with, with whom I am well pleased. Listen to him. So God the Father is saying, listen to God the Son. So if he says from the beginning of creation, God the Father is telling us to listen to Jesus, God the Son. Now, this whole issue is really an issue of authority. Now, for instance, a lot of debates in the church over fairly, uh, over fairly important things like baptism and Calvinism, Arminianism, uh, the millennium, the form of church government. But in those debates, all sides agree the Bible is our final authority. And we're trying to work out what this authority means. But when it comes to the creation issue... It's whether the Bible is our final authority, or do we need to go to secular science to tell us what the Bible means? Like one offender in this is Dr. Hugh Ross, and he rather infamously said that God's revelation is not limited to the Bible's words. The facts of nature may be likened to a 67th book of the Bible. Now, we're still waiting for him to publish a Bible with 67 books. We haven't seen it from him yet, but there's a problem with that. Because when you look at how the apostles taught, it's very different from that. You see, the Bereans were commended because they checked out the apostle Paul with the scriptures to see if Paul was telling the truth. The scriptures for them was their final authority, and they were commended for it. And Paul himself said, all scripture is God-breathed and profitable for doctrine, reproof, for correction, for instruction and in righteousness, that the man of God may be complete, thoroughly equipped for every good work. So we see not, not all scripture apart from Genesis, but all scripture. And we see here the inspiration of scripture and the inerrancy because God doesn't make mistakes, but also the sufficiency of scripture. And that was the big debate in the Reformation was about the sufficiency of Scripture. Do we need Scripture plus something? Or do we have Scripture alone? So if we've established the Bible as our authority, what does this authority teach? Well, let's look at Genesis 1. A very distinct pattern we see here. And this is just the interlinear of the days of creation. You can look a bit further. Uh, check out this article, creation.com slash numbering for more. But what we see in this is a very distinct pattern which goes against what the Big Bang Theory teaches and what evolution teaches. See, here is a summary of what was done on each of the six days of creation. See, day one, we have, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. So we've got the, the universe being created heavens and earth, but notice one thing, the earth started cool and dark. Then God created, said, let there be light and there was light. So first of all, it's cool and dark. The Big Bang says things started hot and bright. So already we've got a contradiction between the Big Bang and what the God's word tells us. Now, day two, we have the separation of waters below and waters above. So you've got the creation of the expanse. The rakia means the expanse. Some older translations have firm, firmament, but in fact the word expanse is a better translation of what God did. He expanded space-time. 
and possibly faster than light because God is not limited by the speed of light because he created distance and time and speed is distance divided by time so he's God's not limited by things that we are limited by he is a creator of things he's not limited by what he created now day two is unique in that it doesn't say God said things were good after day two and this is because the separation of water was not yet complete because on day three we have a further separation and this time we have the Waters gathered into one place and the dry land appeared. And then God called it good because the separation of water is now complete. And it's interesting, waters gathered into one, into one place seems to indicate a single pre-flood continent. But then on day three, God created the plants and called it good again on day three. So day three, we have God calling it good twice. On day two, didn't call it good at all because it wasn't yet complete. Now day four, we have the creation of the sun, moon, and stars. Now this is an interesting problem because evolution says the sun happened before the earth and some stars are older than the sun. The Bible's very clear. The earth is three days older than the sun, moon, and stars. And some of the church fathers even use this history in their arguments with the pagan sun worshippers because they said, well, the true God who made the sun even made plants grow without the sun. So God doesn't need the sun to grow plants because he did it on day three and then he made the sun to show how foolish it was to worship the sun instead of the one who made the sun. And their argument depended on Genesis being historical fact and not myth or allegory. And on day five, we have the swimming and the flying creatures. Day six, we have the land creatures. Now, another problem is that evolutionists believe that birds and pterosaurs and dolphins and the plesiosaurs evolved from land creatures. The Bible is very clear. They came a day before the land creatures. That's another contradiction between evolution and millions of years with what God's word says. So there's no, it's no solution to try to play, make the days long periods of time because the order is also doesn't match what the evolutionary order is. And of course, day six, we have a creation of man. And we see in Genesis two that it was one man and one woman. And then God called that very good. So let's look at Genesis 1 and see what it actually means. Now, now people seem to think there's a very hard, it's a very hard passage to, to interpret. I think it's one of the easiest passages in the Bible to understand. We have the evening and morning one day. Now it doesn't say the first day in Hebrew. You see, it says Yom Echad, one day. See, first day would be Yom Rishon. Uh, but the thing is, you can't talk about a first day unless you've got other days, and the other days hadn't come into existence yet. So you had to say day one, but after day one occurred, now you can talk about a second day, third day, fourth day, fifth day. And notice, sixth day actually has the article here, the sixth day. It's a special day where God created uh, humans in his own image. So what does day mean? Well... It's pretty interesting to, to look at the number of different meanings of the word day. But in fact, when you have the context, you should know that it's not that difficult because certainly day doesn't have to be a literal day. If I say in my father's day or in Queen Victoria's day, it's, a, it's an indefinite period of time. But if I told you that uh, we've been off work for six days, how long do you think we've been off work for? Millions of years? Well, no, when you have a number there, you know it actually constrains the possible meaning to an ordinary day or a part of that day. But also, if I told you that I'm going to, to bed on Tuesday evening and getting up the morning of the following day, what does that mean? I'm not going to be in bed for millions of years, I promise you. Now, when you have an evening and a morning, you know it's an ordinary day. So in Genesis, though, you've actually got uh, three defines. You've got evening, morning, and number. So God is trying to tell you three times what day means in this passage. 
So that's why I'm saying it's one of the easiest passages in the Bible to understand because it's got three definers of what the word day means. Now, let's look at another thing to, to look at is how old is the earth? Well, again, when you have the Bible straightforwardly, you've got these passages here. Okay, now there are some people who tell you that there are many gaps in the genealogies here. I'm going to tell you that's actually a bit of an irrelevancy because there can be no time gaps because we see the 130 years between Adam and Seth. There are 105 years between Seth and Enosh. So even if Seth was a great, great grandson of Adam, there are still 130 years between the two. And therefore, Genesis 5 and 11 have no time gaps, which is why you can add up the, the numbers here and get a good idea of the age of the earth from this. Although I don't think there are any gaps in the names here, especially not these two, because clearly since he named Adam, uh, Adam named Seth, there's clearly a father-son relationship. And Seth named Enosh, again, a father-son relationship. You have Lamech naming Noah. Noah went with his three sons on board the ark. Uh, also, Enoch was the seventh from Adam. So I don't think there are any people gaps there, but there certainly are no time gaps in Genesis 5 and 11. And some of my colleagues have calculated some possible, uh, some leeway in the ages, but there's only so much you can go. Like if you have the Greek text, the Samaritan, the, the Septuagint, you've got a bit more leeway. But I can't see how you can even stretch it to, say, an 8,000 year age of the earth. And here is a little chart for you ages and the lifespan of the people in Genesis 5 and 11. And remember, Luke treated those guys as real people and ancestors of Jesus Christ. So one question to ask then is, if you can't escape the clear teaching there, can you say that Genesis is just meant to be poetry? So is Genesis poetry? Well, let's look at what Hebrew poetry looks like. Because we have undoubted Hebrew poetry, we have the Psalms. Now, Hebrew poetry is not about rhyme or rhythm, but about something called parallelism, which is a fancy way of saying you, you say one thing and instead they say the same thing with different words. Like this famous Psalm here, the heavens declare the glory of God, the sky above proclaims his handiwork. See, heaven and sky up there, they're both doing the same thing. Day to day's pours forth speech, night to night reveals knowledge. Again, day to day and night to night mean the entire 24 hour cycle. Okay, so you're saying the same thing with different words. Well, another type of poetry is found in the book of Proverbs and it's called antithetical parallelism, which just means say one thing and then say the opposite. The wicked flee when no one pursues, but the righteous are as bold as a lion. You see, wicked versus righteous. One is Brave one is cowardly. And again, he who keeps the law is a wise son, but a companion of gluttons shames his father. See, so son and father, wise and foolish. So you've got the contrast there. So if Genesis was, was poetry, it should look like the Psalms, but it clearly doesn't. It's clearly very different uh, from the Psalms and the Proverbs. In fact, the only time you see gen uh, poetry in Genesis is if someone is being quoted, but the actual narrative part of it, the actual storyline of Genesis is clearly not poetic. It doesn't look anything like this. So is Genesis history? Well, here we have to go into a bit of Hebrew grammar, but bear, bear with me here, because the Hebrew historical narratives in the Bible all have a certain distinctive verb pattern. Now, what I'm going to show you is what the verb pattern is. See, the narrative begins with a type of verb called katal or historic perfect. Now, katal is Hebrew for he killed. It's that pattern of verb. He killed, he laughed, he spoke, he ate. But then you've got a distinctive type of verb which continues the narrative called the vav consecutive or vayiktol, now, vayiktol means then he killed. So it's that sort of verb. Then he ate, then he laughed, then he spoke. You see, you got the sequence consecutive 
a sequence of events, and that is what the valve consecutive is doing, is saying this happened, then this happened, and then this happened. Okay, so you find this sort of verb throughout the Hebrew historical narrative parts of the Bible. So now let's look at Genesis and see what it looks like. And sure enough, the first verb, bara, in the beginning God created. It's that sort of verb that starts a historical narrative. And then you got the Vav consecutives, Vayomer, and God said, let there be light, and there was light, and God saw that it was good. So you got 20 plus Vav consecutives in Genesis 1 alone. So any reader of the original Hebrew in Moses' day would understand this was intended to be understood as historical narrative, not as allegory or mythology. Now let's look at some other things here. How does the rest of Scripture interpret Genesis? Well, first of all, I think one of the easiest ways to understand what Genesis one means is that God himself has told us what he meant. When he gave the Ten Commandments, he wrote them with his own finger, and one of them was this one. Remember the Sabbath day. Six days you shall labor, do your work, but the seventh day is a Sabbath to the Lord your God. And God told the Israelites why he gave this command. For in six days the Lord made heaven and earth, the sea, and all that is in them, and rested on the seventh day. So he's telling us here what he meant by Genesis 1. It was a pattern for our working week. So he's telling us here that the days of Genesis 1 were the same sorts of days as our working week. See, if the days were millions of years long, are we supposed to work for six million years and rest for one million years? I mean, a nice long weekend to look forward to, I agree. But you wouldn't live that long, unfortunately. So if God's told us what he meant by Genesis, I think that should be that should settle the argument. And also he's told us that Genesis is actually a historical event because we're supposed to work in real time because God worked in real time. Only the fact that God really worked in history over those six days is an example for us to work over six days. Now, let's go to the New Testament now. I've shown you what Jesus said about it. Let's see what Paul says. He said Adam was first formed and Eve. He's actually affirming what Genesis 2 tells us, that God made Adam from the ground. Uh, Adam had time to name the animals, which was an exercise of authority. Remember, Genesis 1, God gave man and woman dominion over the rest of creation. And Genesis 2, Adam is ex exercising this dominion by naming the animals. And then God made Eve from Adam's rib. So, so Paul is affirming Genesis 2 as history. And then he affirms Genesis 3 as history because Genesis 3 is very clear Adam, that Eve was deceived by the serpent. Adam was not deceived, but he sinned anyway. Maybe that's why the fall is dated from Adam's sin, because Adam did it willfully. Now, when you look at Genesis, one thing you notice when you read through it, whether it's English or Hebrew, is that it's a unity. There's no uh, clear break between Genesis 11 and Genesis 12. That's only humans who put the chapter divisions there. In the Hebrew text, there's no break there. In fact, my commentary went to Genesis 12, 3 to include the Abrahamic covenant. I didn't stop at Genesis 11, even though my commentary says it did. Oh, you got a bit of a bonus in my commentary. You got some discussion of the chat people in Genesis 12 to 50, but there's no distinct, there's no break between it. It's, it's a unity here. And I showed you the genealogies don't see any break because Luke treats the people before Abraham as just as historical as those after Abraham. And then you got the book of Hebrews, the Hebrews chapter 11, you got these heroes of the faith and they start off with Abel, Enoch, and Noah. Again, these guys were just as historical as anyone else. And they got the genealogy in, in First Chronicles as well. Now, another objection that gets thrown at us is that somehow what we are saying here as a ministry is some sort of 20th century American aberration. No, that's not true. Even though you've got very uh, influential people claiming this, and one of them again is Dr. Hugh Ross, who claimed uh, that many church fathers interpret the creation days as long periods of time. And he enlists a number of these people. And the lesson to give you here is don't take anyone's word for it. Go to the original sources. 
So what do they in fact say? Now here's one of them, Basil. He mentions here that he gave a series of sermons on Genesis 1 called the Hexameron, which means in six days. And he goes to Genesis 1, 5, and there is evening, morning, one day. And he says, 24 hours fill up the space of one day. Well, he's claiming the days of creation were 24 hours, not long periods of time. That seems as clear as mud, doesn't it? And then we see again, it is as though it said 24 hours measure the space of a day. So interesting. Uh, this is one of the guys Ross claimed taught uh, long creation days, and he's very explicit here that days of creation were 24 hours. Now let's go to the medieval period. One of the guys that uh, Hugh Ross mentions was Thomas Aquinas. Let's quote him. He's probably a leading philosopher, theologian of the Middle Ages. But he goes into the work of the third day and he said, it was said at first he called the light day for the reason that later on a period of 24 hours is also called day where it said there was evening, morning, one day. So very clear again, this is a 24 hour period because it has evening and morning and a number one. And he says that clearly designates a 24 hour day. This is Thomas Aquinas, a leading theologian of the Middle Ages. Then we get into the Reformation, the father of the Reformation. We know from Moses the world was not in existence before 6,000 years ago. We assert that Moses spoke in the literal sense that the world with all its creatures was created within six days as the words read. What a radical idea, as the words read. And he gives this advice. If we don't comprehend the reason for this, let's remain pupils and leave the job of teacher to the Holy Spirit. Yeah, take God at his word rather than try and tell God what he really meant to say. How then does this relate to the gospel? I mean, we've been rebuked before by people who say, hey, don't worry about Genesis and Adam and Eve and just preach the gospel. Okay, then I'm going to follow the example of the greatest gospel preacher in history. I don't mean Billy Graham, I mean the Apostle Paul, fair enough. So how did he preach the gospel? Well, we see this in 1 Corinthians 15. Now, he's reminding us uh, that his audience of the gospel by which you are being saved, that Christ died for our sins in accordance with the scriptures, that he was buried, that he was raised on the third day in accordance with the scriptures. You see, the gospel doesn't dangle rootlessly in a vacuum. It depends on the rest of history revealed in the scriptures. See, gospel means good news, but you can't understand good news unless you know there's bad news. You see, why do we need a savior? It's because we're sinners. And Paul goes on to explain where sin came from and where it entered the human race and the consequence of it. So where do you think he goes? He says, for as by a man came death, by a man has come also come the resurrection of the dead. For as an Adam all die, so in Christ shall all be made alive. See here, he's going back to Genesis 3. He's going back to our ancestor Adam and saying that uh, we die because of Adam. Adam sinned and was punished with physical death. God said, you were made from dust. Now you're going to go back to dust. That's clearly physical death, at least here. And that's why Jesus, the second person of the Holy Trinity, took on human nature so he could live a perfect human life and die a blameless sacrifice and pay the penalty we deserved. And at the end of his time, he said, it is finished, which in Greek is one word, tetelestai, and that was written on bills of debt to say paid in full. So Jesus' death paid in full for every sin a believer will commit. It's been nailed to that cross, as Paul says in Colossians. But that, of course, wasn't the end of it, because on the third day, Jesus rose from the dead, and it's clearly a physical resurrection. The tomb was empty. He ate fish. He appeared to 500 people at once, which proved he was who he claimed to be, and that God had accepted the sacrifice. And Christianity stands or falls on the resurrection. Christianity would have been dead on arrival if they could have found the body of Jesus, but it never could, of course. All they could do is make up stupid stories like you see in Matthew's gospel or just tell everyone that when Jesus, sorry, just tell everyone that when you were asleep, the disciples came and saw the body. Well, how silly is that? Because if you're asleep, how could you possibly know that? Makes no sense whatsoever. That's how desperate they were to explain away the historical fact that Jesus really had physically conquered death. But you see how Paul makes the connection here. 
uh, in this chapter, he emphasized the physical bodily resurrection, the first fruits of the resurrection of all believers, bodily resurrection. But he connects that to the bodily death of Jesus on the cross with the physical death, bodily death that Adam brought because of sin. There's a logical connection. Adam brought physical death. Jesus brought physical resurrection from the dead. So this is, this is Genesis 3. Then he goes to Genesis 2. The first man, Adam, became a living being. And he calls Adam the first man explicitly. He's not one of a whole lot of humans evolving from ape-like creatures. He's explicitly called the first man. And his contrast with Jesus was called the last Adam, not the second Adam, the last Adam. And the contrast is that the first man had he made from dust and life was brought, breathed into him. But the last Adam came from heaven and is the life giver. So Paul's gospel message has gone to Genesis 3 and now to Genesis 2. But then also he went to Genesis 1. And he goes to the events of day three, where God created different kinds of seeds to reproduce after their kind. Notice, not one kind evolving into different kinds, variation within the kind, but definitely distinct kinds. And Paul makes this theological point about different kinds of, of seeds based on the history of Genesis 3, but makes the theological point from it. But the theological point presumes the history is real. And then he goes to the events of days five and six. Not all flesh is the same. There's one kind for humans, animals, birds, and fish. Again, separate creation of these creatures. And this is the things God created on days five and six. But you notice he's reversed the order to put humans first. And then he goes to the events of day four. And again, he mentions the same things Genesis 1 mentions on day 4, the sun, the moon, and the stars. So again, he takes the history of Genesis and makes deep theological points from this history. And one thing you notice is that he expects his hearers and readers to already know what God did during creation week and who Adam was. Paul didn't have to explain very much. He expected his readers to already be aware of it, which shows that the early church must have been discipled in the book of Genesis. Right from the early days of the church, Genesis is part of Christian discipleship. And this is where you find the first prophecy of the Messiah, the offspring or seed of the woman. And this is a prophecy of the virginal conception. Jesus is the seed or offspring of the woman because he has no human father. So you see how all the doctrines of Christianity had their beginnings in the early chapters of Genesis. And this answers a question we've covered in more and more detail, but I want to go into why it matters for, the, for, for, for Genesis, is why is there death and suffering if it's a God of love, okay? And I've given you the big picture here, is that death was not the way God made it. It's an intruder into God's very good creation. It was man that brought death into the world, while evolution says it was death that brought man to the world. Survival of the fittest is rarely death of the unfittest. And under evolution, the meek do not inherit the earth. So I'm really puzzled by people who want to tell me that Jesus used evolution to create because it's totally against the character we see in the Gospels. Now, I'm not saying you're not a Christian if you believe in evolution. I'm saying there's a huge logical problem trying to mix the two. And one person who did try to mix the two was the founding chairman of Creation Ministries in Australia, who really tried to be a theistic evolutionist for decades until he realized he could not reconcile this picture with God's word. So he repented of believing this and he trusted in what God's word tells us. And this, of course, leads to the whole idea of why millions of years doesn't work. Because in the beginning of Genesis, in Genesis 1, rather, he told us everything was very good. Now, understand where the millions of years came from. Where does it come from? It goes back to about the year 1800, thereabouts, those, so those sorts of years there. People like Hutton and Lyle, who rejected the global flood and believed the rocks and the fossils formed slowly over millions of years of slow and gradual processes. So it means that Adam and Eve must have been on all these rock layers. The problem is these rock layers contain fossils of both humans and animals. And that means you have death, but also you have diseases and suffering. You see that in the fossil record. 
And then God calls all this very good. Now, it's interesting, the fossil record shows evidence not only just of death, but things like gout and osteoporosis and bone cancer. And then God's saying, here, everything here is very good. God says bone cancer is very good, don't you know? Well, I don't know what, what very bad is supposed to mean. But see, this is the logical outcome of trying to mix millions of years with the Bible as you're putting death, suffering, and disease before sin. And how much the Bible do we have to rip apart? Well, the Bible is very clear. Death is the last enemy. It's not the way God made it. We have Romans 5. As sin came into the world, death through sin. So death spread to all men because all sin. And he mentions Adam and Moses. The point is, Romans 5 contrasts two heads of humanity. We have Adam who brought a sin and death with Jesus who brought righteousness and life. Then we see the same contrast condensed next chapter. The wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. So over and over again, we're seeing how much of the Bible, mostly New Testament, that has to be ripped apart to try to mix with millions of years and evolution. And this is clearly the wrong sort of picture here because the Bible is God's word. Now, I've been rebuked before. People tell me the Bible's not a scientific textbook. And I say, well, thank goodness, because textbooks always go out of date. The Bible never does, of course. So maybe we should wait for the secular world to catch up with God's word. So let's look at some history here, because we've established that death and suffering came in because of Adam's sin. So when did this happen? Well, first of all, it must have happened after Satan fell because Satan tempted Eve and Eve uh, tempted Adam. Now, first of all, we know it can't be here because at the end of day, uh, day six, everything is still very good. Now, there's a view called the gap theory, which tries to have the fall of Satan in a made up gap between Genesis 1 1 and 1 2. But by the time of six days, everything's still very good. Satan hasn't fallen yet. And it must have been after creation week, but also after God blessed the seventh day and called it holy. There's no fall happening there. So how much time do we have? Well, it must have been before Cain was conceived because Cain was conceived in Genesis 4. Adam and Eve had already sinned in Genesis 3 and been thrown out of the garden. The conception happened after the fall. And we know that Cain was a very wicked man. Okay, so the thoughts happened before then. So how long do we have between Cain's conception and the fall? I would say not very much because Adam and Eve were told to multiply. Genesis 1.28 shows that marriage and children were God's idea before the fall. God told them to bear children. And by definition, if they're sinless, they're obedient to God because sin is disobedient. So they must have been, if they were sinless, they would be obeying God's command to have children. But clearly, the first conception was after the fall. So you haven't got very much time between creation and fall. May I think the as long as the first female cycle is all you have. So you've probably got a month at the most between creation and the fall, maybe even a couple of weeks. And all I'd give you is probably a few days because we have this passage here uh, that God was walking in the garden in the cool of the day. Now, in Hebrew, there's a special type of verb which indicates a habitual repeated action. So if it's a habit, it must have happened a few times. Because remember, when see, Adam and Eve tried to hide from God because they knew that God was doing his afternoon walk through the garden. So it must have happened a few times for it to be a habit that God made. So therefore, uh, there must have been a few days to build up a habit. The first time it happens is not a habit. So you've got a few days there. Now, it's intriguing when you look at the Jewish calendar. You have Rosh Hashanah, which is the Jewish New Year. And then you have Yom Kippur, the Day of Atonement, 10 days later. So is that because the fall happened on day 10? I'm not going to be dogmatic about it, but it's an intriguing possibility. And it's consistent with the reason I've shown you here. Now, another thing to, to look at is, in fact, all animals were created as plant eaters. Very clear teaching there. Animals and plants, the original diet was vegetarian. Now, we're allowed to eat meat now, okay? Because God told us we can. And look how he told us. As I gave you the green plants, now I give you everything. You see, he reminds Noah 
that the original diet was plants. But now God's permitting animals as food, and that's never been revoked. In fact, Jesus ate fish after his resurrection, and we know he ate the Passover lamb. And Jesus was sinless, therefore eating meat is not a sin. And one reason for this permission might be because when Adam sinned, God cursed the ground. So after that, plants were no longer as nutritious, and he allowed us to have animals as part of our diet. And broccoli is proof of the curse. And you might say my, my home country is proof of the curse because of all the nasty animals we have in Australia uh, that will kill you. Okay, but that wasn't the way God made it originally. So let's look at what death means in Scripture. See, human death is a, a problem enough. Okay, let's say Romans 5 and 1 Corinthians 15 are emphasizing human death. But here's a problem is that we have human fossils, undoubted human fossils, that are dated to about 350,000 years ago by dating methods that they have to accept. If you're a long ager, you have to accept these dating methods. And yet, you got human fossils 350,000 years ago. And so how do you stretch Genesis back that far to put Adam that far back? And you've got clearly intelligent um, activity there, but also... A sinful activity because you've got the evidence of cannibalism and murder there and warfare. Okay, so you've got people who are killed by sinful means, so therefore this must have come after Adam's sin, and yet the evolutionary dating method puts them at 350,000 years ago. So human death is a common blind spot of many old earth compromises. That the problem is having human death before Adam, you can't escape it. Now, what about animal death? Well, first of all, you have a number of different passages, like the original diet of humans was clearly vegetarian. But the thing is, you also have this passage in Isaiah 11 and 65. The wolf shall dwell with the lamb, a leopard and the goats, the calf and the lion, and the little child leading them, and playing over the, the hole of a cobra and an adder's den. You see, you got this animal um, harmony here in some sort of future state. And when you look at the commentators on Isaiah, they always tell you that Isaiah was looking back to Eden. He was thinking that this is a sort of restoration of Eden. He expected his readers to think of Eden, which was a state of animal harmony before sin came and ruined it all. So this is another clear evidence that the original created order had no animal or human death in it. And Isaiah says, they shall not hurt or destroy in my holy mountains. So what we have now is hurting or destroying is clearly not the way God originally made it with all the hurting and destroying we see in the living world today. So what about plant death? See, plant death doesn't count in the Bible. You've got to go by the biblical categories. See, the death we're talking about is what we call nefesh chayah, which is translated as living soul. When God made Adam from the dust, he breathed upon him, he became a nefesh chayah, living soul. But it's also translated as living creature when it talks about the animals, the the beasts of the earth, the whales, the fish, the birds are all called nefesh chaya, but plants are never called that. Therefore, as far as the Bible is concerned, plants are not living things. Therefore, plants don't die. Um, it talks about the plants are withering, but they're not dying. So as far as the Bible is concerned, plants are God's solar-powered, self-reproducing food factories, the bases, the, the bottom of the food chain. So when did animals start eating meat? So I told you when humans were given permission to eat meat was clearly after the flood and clearly after the fall. But animals were clearly eating meat before the flood. After the fall, certainly. But we know from the fossil record that there must have been carnivorous behavior, meat-eating behavior before the flood because we've got evidence of meat-eating in the fossil record which came from the flood. And therefore, meat-eating must have happened before the flood. So how uh, long before the flood? Well, I think there's a clue in Genesis where God warns Cain, if you do well, will you not be accepted? If you do not do well, sin is crouching at the door. And the verb here is 
robet, which is a masculine verb, and it's actually a comparison with a crouching and a predatory animal ready to pounce on prey. So it looks by the time of this, there was already animals known for being predators. That, poor, that God could compare sin to this dangerous predatory animal. And we know that when, when that happened, because we see that Eve named Seth as a replacement for Abel, and Seth was born 130 years after Adam and Eve were created, okay? So we've got a timeline there. Maybe it was 129 years after four already predation was known. And as I say, predation was certainly around by the time of the flood because we have this sort of fossil here, a duck-billed dinosaur, tailbone, and it has a T-Rex tooth there. So it means this creature actually survived an attack by a T-Rex because of the bone healed around the tooth. So therefore it survived the attack. So the T-Rex was clearly a predator, but it missed this time and the thing got away. So there's a bit of a history here of where death came from, both humans and animals. It's important to understand this biblical history, but fortunately, what we see today, uh, we've got a hint of it in Isaiah of some future state where it won't be as nasty as this, but also we have the promise of the new heavens and new earth. And we see all the words we have here of promises of redeem, restore, recover, return, renew, resurrect. And all these have this re-prefix, which points to an original creation that was ruined. You see, what does restoration mean? It means going back to what we had before. But according to long earth, old earth believers, we've had millions of years of death and suffering in our history. So restoration means going back to millions of years of death and suffering. Well, no, thank you. The Bible is very much clearer. God will wipe away all tears. There'll be no more death, sorrow, crying, or pain. Why is that? Because the curse will be abolished. <clears throat> all these things were the result of the curse, and the curse will be abolished. And you see how Paul, and sorry, this is John going back full circle. He's going back to the condition before sin, before the curse. And he even talks about the tree of life once again flourishing. You see how he goes full circle. You can't understand the end of the Bible unless you understand the beginning of the Bible. So every doctrine of Christianity has its beginnings in the early chapters of Genesis. There's a lot more I could talk about with Genesis. After all, I wrote an 800-page book about it, and we have a 12-part teaching series, as I mentioned before. Um, but this is a good time to, to, to explain why we do what we do. What motivates creation ministries? Well, the Apostle Peter told us to honor Christ the Lord as holy and be prepared to make a defense to anyone who asks you a reason for the hope that is in you. We're supposed to have reasons and answers and be prepared for this. We're supposed to be prepared for reasons. See, the Christianity is not a blind faith. In fact, Jesus told us the greatest command, love the Lord, you go with your heart, soul, strength, and your mind. There's nothing in the Bible about checking your brains in at the church door. We're supposed to engage our brains and nourish them on God's word. So this is the positive reason, but there's also the other side of the same coin, demolishing arguments and every pretension that sets itself up against the knowledge of God, and we take captive every thought to make it obedient to Christ. So you've got the, the, the positive case, having reasons for what we believe, but also demolishing arguments against what we believe. And just to show you, we are not just an anti-evolution ministry or even an intelligent design ministry. We want to point people back to Jesus Christ. I started with Jesus in my talk. I'm ending with him because Jesus is called the first and the last, the Alpha and the Omega. And one way you can do this is by our Creation Magazine. And you've got a chance to subscribe here online. And this has proven to be our best witnessing tour. It's been going for over 40 years now. It goes to over 100 countries. And we've got hundreds of letters on file just like this, like a man who'd who raised in a church, he went away from it, but in fact, he had faithful friends who were witnessing to him. And one of the tools they used was Creation Magazine. 
and he could see evolution and millions of years hasn't got a leg to stand on. Creation makes perfect scientific sense. So if it's a creator, then I'm, I'm, he must own me. I must be accountable to him. How could I become right with him? And that's why every magazine presents the gospel. And here is an example of why it's a great family equipping tool. Uh, this lady said that it encourages her own faith, but also she could teach her children the truth of creation because you won't get that in the government schools as well as to witness to her friends. And speaking of witnessing, it's not a question of do we witness to our children, but who is doing the witnessing? Make no mistake, your kids are being witnessed to. It's a question of what sort of witness you want them to have. And so here's a, a way of getting a far better sort of witness, and this is the Creation Magazine. And in fact, you can subscribe to this magazine. It's been going for 40 years. It goes to over 100 countries around the world. It has loads of information to teach you and your family about all sorts of different uh, interesting aspects here. And you can go online, creation.com slash mag. And also there's a digital version so you can give the code to different people in different parts of the world. They can get it onto their own uh, devices. And just to give you an idea of what's in it, we actually have some classic articles here like how do dating methods work? And this is not about how boys meet girls, it's about how old things are and how we know. And we also have interesting things like every issue has an interview with a Bible-believing PhD scientist. So if your kid's going through high school science, uh, they've been told no real science believes in, in creation. Well, every issue, we prove them wrong here. Um, here's another interesting article here about how Adam and Eve could have had all the different races or people groups. Well, what sort of thing happens today? If the parents have enough genetic variation, they can have twins, which look very different, as you see here, but these definitely are twin girls. And therefore, Adam and Eve could have had a wide variety of skin shades in their offspring. Now, what about the issue of millions of years? Well, people might think carbon-14 proves millions of years, but in fact, it's a very strong disprove because carbon decays really quickly. We shouldn't be able to find any carbon. And if something was over about 100,000 years old, we should not be able to detect any carbon-14. It should have decayed by then. So how can we find it in diamonds? A diamond are alleged to be over a billion years old, and yet they still have carbon in them. And I wrote an article about this called Diamonds, a Creationist Best Friend. So, and every magazine has uh, some kids pages in it. We try to have a four kids page. I'm actually co-authoring the kids pages about astronomy for the next uh, uh, about three years. Now you can go to our store because let's face it, there's only so much I can cover in an hour. Uh, but so much more you can find out. And one of the core books we have is called the Creation Answers Book. So if you've ever wondered about why is Creation Day six days that have been talked about, was there a gap and was the flood global or local? Um, what about dinosaurs and the Ice Age and continental drift and the origin of races? And where did Cain get his wife when he wasn't able? Uh, 60 or so questions in 20 chapters of this book. And we also have a more advanced book like Christianity for Skeptics. But in fact, it's very easy to understand. It's a nice, colorful book. If you want to know more about Christianity in general and how we defend it, not just the creation angle, uh, but why do we believe that Jesus is the way to God, that he rose from the dead, the Bible's God's word, and how do we answer other religions like Islam and Hinduism and even atheism? And if you want to know some more, we actually have quite a lot of uh, creation.com slash creation hyphen talk. Okay, creation hyphen talk is the, is the shortcut there. And you can look at some of these talks and far more uh, on your favorite uh, players with a uh, Google uh, Play Music, YouTube, Spotify, Apple Podcasts. We have them all available on these different formats. So creation.com slash creation talk is, uh, is the general shortcut for all these things. So thank you very much for watching. There's a lot more where this came from. And I hope you all keep safe. Thanks very much.